We're about going to go live. live. We're, we're going. Yeah. Now we're live. Hi. Okay. We're coming to you I'm live. stealing Mia for a minute, but I'll bring her back. Hotel okay, cool. in downtown Philadelphia. So Welcome. So glad to have no one here yet. This but table, excited. We'll have, have delegates. And what table is this yeah, going to be, it. Sam? This uh, is a table facilitated by Nia Benjamin, the maker the in focus? Philadelphia. So the, the focus is impact. Is various different provocations focusing on impact. Do we know what this one? The, so that's what's being talked about right over there. Oh, so what's? I see. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> I was like, man, stop. All right, y'all. This is so exciting. Uh, to my knowledge, this is maybe the first live stream of a kindling session. My name's Andrew, and I live in Maine. And um, I'm really happy to be helping to document this today. So we're going to do that. I'm going to do a little um, camera check. Thanks for hanging out. And this is more imagination. So I'm saying here. All right, let me get my notebook out so I can write down my thoughts. I have my Hello. thoughts. Is this being recorded? It's being live streamed. Live streamed. Is that okay with anybody? We have uh, zero so far. <laughs> the number is zero. All right. But, uh, cool. You can only grow from there. Happy to be live streamed to zero. <laughs> <laughs> So how do I participate and not be on that? Is it right here? Okay. Um, your voice might be on it, but then... That's okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you just asked that. Because I was like, oh no, some people... Well, as soon as I see those, I, that's why you saw me jump up the oh. arm. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks for asking. Yeah. This is no, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> of course. No, I want to participate, but... Just don't turn it around on me if I start talking. I won't, yeah. I'll just leave it right here. Hi. Hello. Oh, oh, I will I'm never come back to IP again. Uh, no, no. Please. Okay. please Sorry. But I, there's no, there's no swivel feature. You're the good. thing I have. And I have stopped trying to get myself to overcome it. It's me. Great. Yeah. The rest okay. of me is a good. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Leanne. Leanne, I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, Cross yeah, before. I think so too. Yeah. Where do you live? Yeah. Um, New Jersey. Oh, cool. Yeah, you, uh, I live in Maine uh, on Mount Stewart Island. I host a residency program up there and um, make work up there as well. Uh, yeah, well, I'm traveling more after this. So I'm, I'm going to New Orleans on Sunday. Um, an artist who developed a score for a ballet, The Barn in July, is premiering that work um, on Sunday in New Orleans. Exciting. And then the same thing is happening to me the week after that. I'm going to Sunday for the premiere of a film that was shot. At the bar. Oh, wow. festival. I like that you're yeah, it's, you're it's, really it's been really nice. exciting times for you. Yeah, it's great. Well, and then I will be in New York. For, um, we also host a festival in New York every year of work that was made up of um, work that came to the bar. Which festival? It's called New York and the City. New York City. Yeah, it's in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. It's a space called Cloud City, which is. Um, on North First between Barry and White, it's like a DIY. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's called Barnfest. Keep an eye out. I'm not a city person. I probably see more stuff in the city than I see in my own theater. Well, there's a lot to see in the city. Yes. 
I'm always crazy, crazy about what's presented in my theater that I haven't booked. I didn't say that. <laughs> wow. Um, but there's so much great work, and I missed all the stuff that I'm doing. Like, I do, I do too this year. Sometimes I'll go down. Did you see Slave Play? Did you see Slave Play too? In the same week I saw no. Slave Play, Jeremy Harris. It's being led by three fantastic folks, and we're addressing impact and the way it is happening or how we'd like it to happen. So please, please introduce yourselves. I'm going to bounce away. Thanks. Hello, hello. Yeah, come on down. Down, this reminds me of the tea table in Alice in Wonderland. No room, no room. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Wendy Babel, and I am not affiliated with any fancy organizations other than IFA. I'm a freelance director, um, teaching artist, and uh, and writer. Um, I'm gonna ask Jen and Nia to introduce themselves, and then I'm just gonna frame the just kind of some foundations for the conversation today, but please know that we're making our own rules. And at any moment, should we feel the passion to diverge from the map, then we can forge a new path with the boards. So um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues and then frame our discussion and we'll have a chat. Hello. Um, Director at Paramount Theater in Austin. Um, I'm also a composer and lyricist, and uh, getting to kind of own that side of me again, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, just a note in case those of you that weren't in here when we took our live streaming our conversation today. So just. Um, I will have that. Now's your time. Hello, friends. Now was the time for fun. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, I think that uh, I'm also on the board of IPAY, and conversations around impact have been a big part of our conversations at the board level. Um, not only how does the organization um, continue to serve and be um, in, an, in an urgent place of making change in the community, but also how does this organization serve all of those that go back to their own communities that live in So it's been a big conversation at our board. Um, and certainly in my own organization, just knowing how to define the word impact, whether it's for a grant, whether it is in the annual report, whether you're just telling stories to your donors or you're teaching artists, struggle. You know, we know it here, but putting it into words, putting it into the language um, has been a challenge for us. So I think this idea of impact is such a global sense, and then there's this real need to get specific. Um, so that's something that I think. I mean, it feels like drowning sometimes, but you know, like trying to really come to this place. Hello, everyone. My name is Mia Benjamin. Um, I'm a shaker with John Allen. I'm based in Philadelphia. I am the co-artistic director of a um, very good performance company called Life and Planet. They're based here in Lakewood here. Um, and I also work for a foundation in Philadelphia, a very regional and very local performance foundation called the Media Foundation. So questions of impact sort of in and out of my life, whether it's with my artistic work or whether it's what I do in my free time. Um, and, you know, for me, I think as a young woman of color stepping into a leadership role at, at an artistic institution and at a philanthropic institution, it's really important to um, define and challenge the ways impact has been, you know, handled in the field thus far. And, and um, seeing sort of the ways leadership is changing throughout various industries, the different ways that, you know, people color are sort of gods interpreting the ways of how it's getting shared back out into people. So the way we're set up uh, architecturally today is in a long table format. There's a little bit of information on the table about that. And this has its benefits and limitations as any, any form of dialogue would have. So, um, there are a few things that I think are very helpful to check in about. One is that there can be silence. It's okay to give ourselves processing time and not feel like we need to fill the air with words. That is okay. Um, 
there, uh, it encourages us to be mindful of our airtime. How much are we talking in relationship to the others at the table? Um, should we get a flood of new individuals joining us? Uh, there is the, the opportunity to retreat from the table and re-enter into the table. Know that you are welcome to do that at any time. And uh, the last thing that I'll add is that I, I appreciate uh, neurodiversity and know that not all of us do our best expression in the form of spoken word. Um, that's part of the reason why there's brown paper on the table so that if you prefer to visually translate what you need to contribute, please do that. Um, also, we're blessed with a very big open space. If you need to get up and move, you can do that. I'm sure that others will join you. Um, and also, uh, many of us kind of express it in, in auditory ways. So if, if you have a thought that's got to come out in music or sound, we accept that as an offering to the space. So know that all types of expression are welcome and encouraged. The description that was in the program guide and in the app and what this session is about is about impact. And the way it was phrased kind of framed it along um, going from, from us out, our self out, our organization out. And I would love to expand these prompts to include uh, the opportunity to express our own story and our own journey. Um, it can be as specific as this is how IPay has had an impact on me. It can be, uh, you know, it can kind of expand out. This is how working with young people has had an impact on me. But uh, there is tremendous value and truth in the individual stories that we have to tell and in our individual journeys. So know that that is also welcome, uh, a welcome offering at this table. Because we are not a group of 50, um, if we can go through um, and share your name with the rest of the group, and uh, if there's something about us that you would like us to know, like what organization you're representing, um, or a question that you have that's kicking around in your head, if it's a sentence or two that will allow us to hear everyone, acknowledge uh, who they are, and, and either where they're coming from or what they're grappling with today. And uh, we don't have to go in a particular order. So when you feel moved. I'm Carolyn Elliott. I'm here representing the Road Stage in Santa Monica, California, which is a presenting organization. And um, I'm also here as a board member so and an ambassador. And I actually just wanted to share a way an audience has impacted us rather than us impacting the audience. And um, we are 10 years old and we had an audience member who lives in our community write rather disgruntled letters sharing that they're deaf and there was nothing for them at our theater. And we went, we didn't even think of that. And so we now are um, presenting six shows in our season across, uh, we've selected a show in each genre because we present multiple genres. And we now have signers, ASL signers at our uh, events, and we are leaning into that in a really big way going forward and are planning our season specifically with works. And there's a work um, that I found because of IPAY um, and the relationships here, Casa Publix and I are talking to each other, um, that we're going to be presenting, which is about exploring the deaf experience as an artist. Okay, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I'm also from the Los Angeles area. I'm the founding director of Los Angeles Choreographers and Dancers, Louise Reichlin and Dancers. Um, and my name is Louise Reichlin. Um, our company does both concert works for grown ups, we do family programming. And we do a tremendous amount of in-school programming. We work with between 25 to 30,000 students a year because we're a big contractor with the LA Unified Schools. 
which I really love doing because that school system over the years has had a lot of arts and they really have trained the teachers to appreciate arts. And um, one of the things that impacted me this year is after we, we go into a school and we'll do usually a series of, we have teaching artists that will do a series of five uh, workshops with students. I will also work with the teachers in a, in a uh, you know, growth thing for them. And then we take the company and do two performances that the students work in, in that we've been teaching them. And afterward, I'll do an assessment uh, with the students. And the thing that was amazing to me recently was working with second graders, which is like seven, eight years old, in how many languages they speak, including uh, one of them in this particular class did sign um, to his grandmother. And it's never the same languages. It's always, it's always uh, Latinx, of course, because uh, it's LA, it's 80%. Um, but there's so many languages, um, Armenian and Russian and just so many. And so many of the students live um, in family situations where there's multiple generations, um, which is actually, I'll probably talk about that later, but we recently started working with seniors also, which is a whole other group for me that I've never really known about. But now that I guess I was kind of a senior, I'm getting a little more interested in that group. But, but what impacted me about these students was how bright they were, how many things they saw in the performance in terms of how characters developed, how they, they knew all the dancers' names. Because when we go in, we almost try to mentor them as we put it together with them, even though it's just that day that we take them all in. They know the names. We know that they can express it afterward because they send us pictures and, and you can tell who they are having to do with their facial, um, what's, you can tell what color they are, what their eyes are shaped like. In other words, they're very aware of it, but they, they really all don't seem like they're aware of it there, but they are. And, and I think there's a, I think, and one more thing is yesterday when I heard the woman from, was it the New Victory? Victory Theater, talk about the uh, data gathering, gathering you're doing. It just blew me away and I, I need to get more of that because it's exactly what we put in. It's what we put in our grants anyway. It's really what I think kids do. The arts allow them to become them and become the center of a world and express themselves. So that's it for now. Thank you, Lotus. Hi everybody, my name is Amy Russell and um, as of Three months ago, I'm the manager of the Children's Theater and the Woods at Book Trap Foundation for Performing Arts, which is right outside Washington, D.C. Awesome. Um, <laughs> we are an outside venue, which is really exciting, wonderful place. And um, in terms of impact, we are just starting to get to the point where some of our audience, they're bringing their children and they remember coming as children. So um, that's really cool to see how impact has um, spanned generations um, between us. It's Eva. Eva um, teaches it from Monkey Park. Um, yeah, so. Uh, we are also a presenter in Sydney, we have a tiny little theatre that is, um, has been specifically gifted for young people, for use by them, um, and for shows um, for them. Uh, we, we've been going for about 20 years now, and uh, in terms of impact, we have uh, worked really hard to tour our works. That's what we predominate in, is tour around the country. We, one of the largest touring theatre companies, and one of the reasons we started was that we felt that there were a lot of young people in remote and regional areas of Australia that were not receiving any theatre, really, at all. But it's changed a lot now, and it's been fantastic in terms of what they're, they're getting. Um, but one thing that we found that was really, really important in the last about five, six years was that there were so many um, adult references to young people and their, um, you know, their, their 
art that's made for them. And we have started working with young people creating our work. So, um, and, and in really bringing their voices into the work that's created for them. And that has gone on for me. It has impacted me incredibly because it's, you know, and it makes me feel very teary about it. But it's, I've received a lot from working with young people to create the very best work for them. Um, uh, and some of those experiences in the classroom, working with them around um, invisibility, that's what we're working with at the moment in the project that we're, we're doing. We predominantly adapt Australian literature, um, and uh, one of them is a, is a little show called Blossom Magic, and it's about invisibility. It's about grandmother makes a child, grandchild invisible, and then can't find the, um, the uh, magic to bring her back to visibility. And working with young people um, on that, we heard very, very clearly that they do feel invisible. And that is something that we're trying to address within the production as well. Um, so the impact um, around that on us as well as this has been Adelaide in South Australia, which has come out of that swing speed windmill. Mm -hmm. A simple space that you'll see tonight, patch theatre company, it's amazing. And a lot of it, I think, comes from the fact that this festival has gone on and its philosophy is those least likely to access the, its philosophy at the moment of the cultural dimension that we created at the moment is those least likely to access the arts have the most benefit. Uh, communities who, yeah, like, like we all do, who don't usually have access, and of course, there's you know, children born into families who take them to things are already way ahead of the curve, um, whereas children born into families who don't understand that. Um, but it's a really easy win to show them the benefits as long as you can get them to a great experience. So, we run a festival where a school that has very, very low resources can travel for free, you see a show, do a really a great show, a highly great show, do a workshop, see an exhibition, all for nine dollars. And often we end up giving away for free anyway. But yeah. access is, I think, key to addressing inequality. And I think addressing inequality over anything else is the key to sharing the arts. Thank you. Access is such a such a complex word. Um, Leon Farrer, I'm VP for Education and Community Engagement at the State Theatre in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And we talk about access a lot, and how we've, we've been trying to get our funders, even my some of the staff. This is Owen. Oh, this is Eric Stratton, by the way. He's he's the other half of the team. But to get people to stop thinking of access as just removing physical barriers or providing a sign language interpreter, but that it can be economic, it can be cultural, it can be uh, uh, comprehension in terms of language, and and just it's been a struggle to broaden pe the way people think about what access means, um, and also to expand their ideas about what we need to do to provide the access. And it is beyond just that narrow definition that so many people seem to have. Um, we actually tackled that in a really specific way at the growth. Um, we had a really extraordinary founder who liked to think sort of as if money was no object. And so we went to a funder and kind of made it up on a spot over lunch and then turned it into a program. But so we have a program called the Family Circle. And we looked at the the barriers and, and access, not so much as just like access, but equity. 
and realizing that mm. our physical structure is imposing and it looks like only white people belong there. And so we put together a program that provides transportation to the theater. It provides a meal, like a communal meal with all of the other families in this program. Um, they get to see a show, but they're also greeted by someone from our education staff who is bilingual. And that person takes them backstage. They get to, depending on the show, see the costumes, meet the artists, touch the instruments, and then see the show. And then, um, then the, I guess, yeah, the, the meal is after. And it started out as a pilot where we only had four families. And we had this really narrow idea for some bizarre reason. We were like, a family. It's a mom, a dad, and two children between five and seven. <laughs> And we realized that was not what was coming. It was like a grandma with a teenager, an infant, and a five-year-old. Like, shit, how are we going to do this? So we've been playing with letting them choose the shows rather than really prescribing. And we have like alum, we've been doing it for four seasons now. And so now there are alumni whose feedback to us was, how can we uh, contribute? We don't want to be a charity. We want to be a part of an active part of the community. So now the mentors help, you know, welcome the families. Um, someone will bring tamales. So it's really turned into this thing that people really want to volunteer and be readers, and also they really want to contribute financially because it feels good because it is making an impact, and you see it in the kids. They feel like they own the space. They're, they're the ones that do the chimes. You know, when it's time to talk about it, we to or whatever we choose to share. mills were shutting down um, because of the economy and uh, the leadership of the country at the time, lots of other factors that I didn't understand when I was little. Um, but every, uh, all of the men in my family worked in the steel mills and um, my dad was a welder, uh, neither of my parents went to college uh, and he was laid off and unemployed for a significant period of time. And, uh, I went to a school district where many of the other kids were coming from similar backgrounds. So um, the arts and culture desert that, that some folks have spoken about of not having access was something that I felt very much as a child. And um, I was the first person in my family to go to college. So I'm a first generation college graduate and I have been navigating that space of um, having a different level of financial means than my, my mom and my brothers uh, and sisters and having to navigate my career with the, um, the ties of home and making sure that uh, my stepdad gets laid off after Christmas that I've put aside additional funds so that I can help and give back. So that kind of first generation um, struggle that, I, that a lot of uh, college graduates experience and then um, going to teach in, after I graduated from college, teaching in a school district where about 90% of the students were free and reduced lunch, um, about the same percentage were uh, identified as Latinx. Uh, many of them were first generation immigrants um, or were that they were immigrants themselves had grown up um, in New Mexico or El Salvador or um, Honduras. And now moving into the realm of IPAY, one of the impact that the organization has had on me is that I've never felt like I've had a lot to offer the field of American TYA because I don't come from a background where I can apply for a fellowship that isn't fully funded and you need to 
it is fully funded, I often can't afford to go away for six weeks from a job that pays the rent and go do that fellowship. Um, and the first IP that I went to, I have this memory of Jim Weiner uh, seeing me walking through the exhibit hall, I'm sure looking a little dazed and confused. And he stopped and he talked to me and we had a, a really lovely conversation and he wanted to know about the work that I was doing. And I remember walking away from him thinking, I don't have anything to offer him. I'm not buying any shows. I'm not with a big institution. I, I don't, why would he want to talk to me? And that experience not being a singular experience, but then rippling out from then the members of IPAY and how um, my worth and value as a member of the community is not determined by the institution that's behind me or the financial needs that I have and recognizing how important that is in how we think as an organization about who sits at the table and who's not here that we want to be here. And how can we take that spirit of radical hospitality and put that into action more systemically to, to you know, like make stories like my story not rare. And I don't think that it is. I think there are a lot of people with similar stories. Um, but I think that's the, when I think about impact of, of IPAY and of a human being on another human being, I think of those moments where you somebody crosses a threshold, like you, you kind of put in your own force field of expectation. Like I had this force field of expectation that I didn't have anything of value to offer. Um, and then someone in just recognizing your humanity, just being another penetrated that force field and makes that connection. And so I am deeply grateful for that and I uh, continue to work to try to pay that forward. And um, and I don't have an elegant way to end that thought, so I'm just gonna say <laughs> in the end. That's <laughs> right. There is an end, but no conclusion. <laughs> so it's right on the paper. Thanks. <laughs> In this action of uh, what you're, what you are, what your organization is doing with these families, there's no. What do you have to get back from them? From that kind of uh, institutional and funder point of view, that transactional type of relationship that we are so accustomed. That we have to prove someone's worth in order to serve that. And so when I use the phrase radical hospitality, I think of an offering of, of food, of transportation, of a place to be included where you have absolutely nothing to gain from the individual that you are or the family or the community that you're connected with. So that's, I think that's how I frame it in my brain. Like that. We're going to use that to describe the program. Take it. <laughs> Take it. Yep. And all the, our goal was literally to create for cultures or families that don't have any escape and a, um, a habit of attending the arts together. And another component of it is we actually provide access to, like, this is how you get discounted tickets at museums. <coughs> this is the free day here. This is where the free shakes here in the park is. So it's not just our venue, it's like teaching how to access what's out there for free because we know how to find it. But if you're not inclined, you don't you don't even know where to look. So your organization had kind of carries a philosophy that when we add water to the ocean, all boats rise. I'm also hyper conscious now after hearing your story about the structure is imposing. I'm like, this This physical structure right here in this room right now is imposing, and I want to wreck it really bad. So I'm just, I'm just staying on <laughs> Put the I table. I draw three big parts. <laughs> 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 so really big parts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, you, if you want to sit on the table, or I don't know. I don't think they'll come apart, but across the table. But it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a two, we, 
our theater is a 1921 historic vaudeville, whatever. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, and it, it's an edifice. It's a landmark. But, you know, we've had situations. We, we just finally, after all these years, formed some committees to outreach to specific areas of the community. And we were saying, well, we were surrounded. Our, our school district is 99, 95% Latino and none of these people come and we look at the program and we're not programming anything no one these people want to see. <laughs> so we, we, we started programming and, and talking to the community about which artists they'd like to see. And I remember at a reception, we had, we had free, one of the local restaurants, free food and so forth. And there was a gentleman who came up to me and said, you know, I've lived in New Brunswick my entire life. I guess he was 50, 60 years old, he says, I walk by this building every single day. This is the first time I've actually set foot inside it. And, and we, we find, because we do all the school day shows, we, the kids come from the, from the community, come all the time. And it's how do we get the next step to get their families to come. And sometimes trying to do something where the kids are coming with the families, the kids have come there, they feel at home already, and letting them bring the adults along and say, hey, come to this great place. You know, I'm, I love it here. You should come and love it too. And kind of using the kids as the conduit to bring the families in. And, and, and also a point that you made about when the community that we've invited in gets there, we want them to feel welcome. So we have our Latino committee and we're programming uh, 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 Latinx artists. But if we don't have anyone in the box office to sell them tickets who speak Spanish, oh yeah, and we have community volunteers and their readers as well. That's it's been important. Um, but you and, and and as you know, you, you know you do it once and you have a success. And how do you keep the momentum? Um, okay, we're done. We've we've we have these these uh, Latinx communities here, and then they start saying, well. You give us a program. Why aren't you giving? Why is it six months before the next program comes along? Um, so that's been a challenge as well. But uh, we had a, a an audience member. We do, were doing a, a couple of August Wilson plays, and we had an audience member who was black uh, confront one of our ushers at the end of the show and say, "This is really great. Um, how come you're only inviting us to black play on the season?" Hmm. Why is that the only time you reach out? So that just makes me think about your, um, I'm not sad that I don't work at that place anymore. <laughs> but I have, I have to tell you. But that, but how do you keep the momentum, you know, that's recognizing um, very often we, because we're trying to be very focused in our impact and we're trying to spend our marketing dollars strategically that it can limit and it sounds like your organization is asking, how can we widen, how can we expand and offer not just more plays that are of diverse content, but also think about how are we building the community and the people that are in the box office that speak multiple languages and thinking you're widening your your definition of access. I think you that's how you were describing it earlier. And that's that's something that that it widens the impact. Uh, like the, the footprint of it, but it's still, it, yeah, it widens and adds to the power of what that impact is in that community. But it, it's, you know, I, I love iPay, and I've been coming to showcase before there was an iPay, and I'm involved in a lot of different groups, and it amazes me how over the years, the progress and the evolution, uh, I don't know, people don't really appreciate how much the organization has grown, listened to the membership, things like what we're doing here today. Some of the groups that we're seeing are all things that if you'd come to 10 years ago, you would not have seen any of this, but mm -hmm. the growth of the organization and the way that it's come from the membership and every, and what you were talking about, talking to Jim Wiener and why would he talk? That's the, the ethos of iPay it, and that the helping one person, even if, I'm not going to directly get a check from them. It's going to raise the entire organization. You know, I, we all have, whether it's our boards or committees that they meet and they keep talking about the same things over and over and nothing ever changes. But I pay, I don't know if I've ever been involved with another organization like that. Um, just there's something 
just um, unique in the way that people, there's an altruism um, that, that I see artists helping other artists and managers helping artists that they don't represent and presenters and, and the sharing and the understanding that, that pitching in, even though you don't see the immediate benefit to yourself, it's just the community like none other that I really experienced. And, and, <laughs> has never bought one of our shows. Uh, there's, there's never been any transaction between us, but a friendship began from Pittsburgh, which has continued not just him, many other people. And, and one of the more unique parties that our Australian delegation as well. Uh, we we not be bad on that. Sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. It's all right, you bring good candy. <laughs> shows from Dallas uh, that come into Austin that just would have never been there if it hadn't been for a space that said, come to this table, even if it's a bit wonky and long. <laughs> but like, we are here to do this work and we're gonna be better at it, all of us, 
because there's a space. And I think that that is what's really exciting. I mean, seeing really unique, amazing work in Chicago that I just, there, there would be no intersection. It would have never happened for me. And then there's this space and you start dreaming of like, wow, wow, maybe. Or like the ice skating show in Montreal. I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Right? And I sit there and go, ice skating. Okay. Austin, Texas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Did you do it? No. I didn't. But I'm still thinking it's about it. I still think it's about it. Even I ice skating. There's an ice in every community. There's an ice I couldn't remember. But no, look, if, <laughs> you think about, like, you see this work and you just start dreaming. And even if you can't, even if you, if you can't even, and even if you don't even like walk down a path, right? It still provides this opportunity to start thinking about different ways. And if we just stayed in our own communities, just doing our thing, making great impact, and yet not even knowing what the potential could be. You know, so I just I, I think about that so often. And I just I use I use love that dog as just like I think about how the unlikeliness that play coming to Austin, Texas. It didn't go to sell very well. My schools loved it. But man, just like what that was. And it was a direct link to me seeing that work at an IP showcase. And falling so deeply in love with what they were trying to do. You know? And so I just, I kind of wanted to invite, I wanted to pass some energy this way. I'd love to. Um, if you if you sure, we'll come back up here in the late, is yes. here's the part where we're okay with like breaking the table, sitting on the table, running around, compressing the table. Yeah, like it's it's all it's all fair game. It's all fair game. The energy can come here too. Yes. In fact, uh, they were professional, not professional, it was a kind of competitive skater. They decide to be out of this world to be creation for a public, like to present it to theatre. The first uh, problem they meet, they met, excuse me. So it was, they didn't have a place. So they were not a band, they were not theatre, they were not circus. So they had a lot of find their place because people they don't fit into are already existing for. Mm -hmm. So we have as a group, we have to think are we permitting those things to happen? Yes, it's take them at least five years that uh, in fact it's nobody is uh, I would say uh, I would translate it my own way. Nobody is a hero in his own country. Mm -hmm. It's like <laughs> it's happened for them somewhere else in Europe. So they did a big festival, they begin to find it in Turkey. And then in Canada, they begin to find it then in Turkey. And then they, they arrive to this windows that the showcase that you see. And now they're doing because what we don't have to forget is we are our own enemy in the sense that we didn't help them. We have to make the road. Nobody has the potential except themselves at the beginning. The other thing that I I just want to add uh, what you were saying about uh, IP. I think not only IP, but I don't want to discredit it, but I think the magic thing about this kind of uh, IP, well, I think the magic is the young audience. I think that's why we are open because we all want to learn the world. And I participate in many ICTAs, and it's the same community, sometimes a bigger one. Having the same objective and are able to communicate at this level of generosity and, and the same compassion about one another. And I think this is really specific to youth audience. That's my video. That's what you talked about. Actually, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
listening to you all, you know, I find myself spinning and spinning on this this phrase that um, you said the structure is imposing. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, I just wrote it down, but Carolyn said it. Oh, yeah. you said it. I'm sorry, yeah, Carolyn. Uh, my name is Liz, um, and uh, that's one of the reasons I come to IPA actually, is because I find that IPA really celebrates this tendency that theater for youth has to play with and push against imposing structures. Um, and that's especially important for me personally because I work for the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., which if you've never seen it before, is a great big white building. Great big white building. Um, it's hegemonic. Uh, it just sort of, okay, too fast to tell you why the Kennedy Center is hegemonic, and then I promise we'll get to a point. Um, the grand foyer is longer than the Washington Monument is tall. Wow. And it contains some 300 tons of Italian marble quarry from the same place where Michelangelo sourced his material. And this is the place where we're trying to make theater for young people. Um, and so making that space, I, yeah, right? I mean, making that space a place that is welcoming, a place that we can play with and push against is really challenging. And I, I, that's what's one reason why I'm sitting here in this chair is to find alternative structures that can maybe subvert that narrative just a little bit. Um, and it's one of the things I find most inspiring about IPAY is the, the very many ways it offers to approach structure, whether that, that imposing structure is distance or um, access or equity, or I mean, it all comes back to equity, right? Um, but I, I, it's one of the powers of collecting the group is sharing these ways. And so have any thoughts? You're a government oh, organization, which makes it even harder. Yeah. Well, so that's the other thing that's really interesting, um, especially right now. The Kennedy Center is uh, um, maintained by the Department of the Interior. Um, so it's that's like the government version of Parks and Rec and like local communities. Yeah. So the okay. Kennedy Center is a national monument, so it's maintained right. by the same people who make the national monuments. Got but it. all of the pro- but the programs within it are essentially nonprofit organizations. So we're still going, and we're still working, but the building is closed around us, um, and it only opens for shows and evenings, um, and that's our reality right now. And in that space, we just closed a show about migration and immigration and refugees, and <laughs> that was one of these moments where I sort of felt this tension around the structure that we're in. I mean, really obvious tension, right? So um, who's taking out the trash? You guys. Well, essential government employees gotcha. are, are okay. taking out our trash. And, you know, like. Who's um, cleaning the marble? Once a week. On it while they go <laughs> once a week, an essential. Yeah, I mean, like, people, these people, people who are not getting paid for their work. That's an astonishing juxtaposition to yes. be in that building under those circumstances. Absolutely. And having performances that are kind of managed by the smaller fiefdoms within the Kennedy Center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah as, as you know That's from being bizarre. Yeah, it's a very it's a very odd place to be working. So um, I find it very inspiring being here because it's it's a it's an incredible structure to be working in. And it's very it's rejuvenating to be among so many people who are proud like minded in the way we approach structure and the way we approach approach hierarchies and patriarchies and in the form of the art, too, mm-hmm. I think the biggest influence that IPA has had on my artistic practice as a maker of theater is releasing me from this idea that a play needs to happen in a certain order. Yes. And as someone who went to school in the United States and is living in a country that privileges the script, as, as the essence and, and the anchor of the production in, in very many ways, to come to IPEI and see things that were impressionistic, yeah. that were in, that used time in a way that was non-linear and trusted that young people would understand that. Um, I had, those impulses lived in me. I, it made some of my professors in graduate school a little crazy. <laughs> Uh, I didn't have language to describe it, but then when I came here and I went, oh, that, it, that that's a real, that's a thing, that's a real thing. Um, and, and how freeing that was. I think IPA has been very freeing to me as an artist 
because it has expanded the possibilities of what can be in the universe, not just for young people, but, but for all of us. And, and that work is vibrant and, and it, it ignites something in us that, that amplifies our energy and wakes us up a little bit more. So I'm all, I've been very grateful to IPA for that because I, I don't know how long it would have taken me to encounter that permission um, had I not of the IPA when I did. That is one thing that I've just taken away again. Like I've taken it away a few years, but I'm really trying to set myself the challenge to not start on day one. That's my big, you know, and I've tried, I've tried it before, and it's, you know, just keeps kind of sliding back to what I know. But my challenge to me personally and to then to the creators I've worked with is to try. Of the script, right. you know, yeah. find it a new in, find it. So, you know, we are at adaptations, and for the next couple of years, we still are, but where is it? another point of entry? And I think that's my, and that's my thing. Mm -hmm. That's been the real eye opener for me, too, actually. Um, my name is Sarah, um, and we uh, have just gotten started um, working for like the theater for young audiences. Like, this is my first IPA conference. And, like, Realizing I, I don't even know what like I don't know about making theater for young audiences. Like watching the Getting Dressed show, like watching what concept just makes words so well, and then like talking to a presenter next to me, talking about her four year old son and his anxieties about getting dressed, the way she thinks it interacts with shows. Um, but the, the way that young audiences deal with time and space and information is like palpably different, uh, and it's also like challenging. Like, you need to like. Think differently and think faster. Um, what, what we do is we make shows that look like movies, um, but we make them live on stage. And our, our concept all along, that's been our concept all along. Um, and originally, also, like how we got people into the theater, we were like, oh, don't worry, like it's a movie, just come on in. Like, you like films, I like films, this one's kind of a Western. And then it was also, you know, an experimental puppet show and like experimental, like new music. Um, but we're always trying to like tell a story use the language of cinema, which we feel like everybody speaks. Um, that's also originally why our shows were without words. Um, it felt like everybody could interpret like this cut to close up and like dissolve into her head. We wanted to use that to tell stories to as many people as possible. Um, but the way that kids watch it is so different. Um, we just had, we did a new show where we did shows for adults in the evening and we had all these high schools in to watch Frankenstein in the day. And our musicians are able to watch the audience and they said, you know, generally this is a theater audience who had never encountered anything like our shows before and they would just watch the big screen, you know, and then they would come up on stage and touch stuff and like realize how we get the theater and eyes for nothing other than the screen above, which is totally fine. That's how you watch a movie and we make sure that that is like can be a singular experience. But apparently the high schoolers just looked constantly like as a band, as a percussionist, that we're, we're making it at each other at the big screen, and like we're very comfortable splitting their life potential all over the place. So when we talk to them, they have like a very different experience. So, uh, yeah. so I kind of wrap this up in here and just learning the cast artists who are playing their journey. Um, and they are actually like the digital age of the but they can like pick up the process and like tell a story like using composition and like practice.
where they are uh, bringing their kids with their service but hey, it's being developed in the same pressures and they need to be heard and heal. And we went to the experiment in South Africa recently, which was very successful. We're hoping to be able to amplify it of doing a little mini capital of theatre for training teachers. Um, so taking it into their learning space and showing them a whole lot of different kinds of theatre jobs, puppetry, etc. And then, and then talking to them about about it and having conversations and talking about the value, not from the educational perspective of what did this play teach, but what else is this doing for a child that that you maybe couldn't do in the classroom? You know, what, what are we able to, to bring, which is different from that, which might be very stimulating and um, you know, very kind of enlightening their, their desire to learn, which is ultimately what you need. You're going to have to have a successful learning space. There's also something inspiring because we know how to training before uh, early years. So, so people who work in nurseries, early years, so like child minders and um, people who work with children and families in you know, social work companies and about encouraging their own creative capacity. Because like, you know, when you've got people, uh, the educators um, in schools who feel like they're not creative, then you you're yeah. encouraging another generation of children to be creative and creative. So one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, in empowering the practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, also because there's not a huge amount of arts and pieces that happen in our nursery and primary school. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can make those practitioners, uh, inspire them, uh, kind of get them to channel that innate creativity, that actually will have much more so then when you're bringing other arts, theater uh, experiences in, or if, if they are going to their own environment or their own or gallery, but actually there's a, there's a kind of a level of understanding that, that, that brings them that they're already there. Um, so we, we did that with the university in Edinburgh, with the um, college there. And I think it's something, I mean, myself and my colleagues, I grew up in a theater family, and I grew up moving. Theater, specifically, you get in a theater bubble. And a lot of those um, uh, students, and not just students, had a lot of them actually had to be here before we had come to, to the school. And we're like, oh my gosh, I'd love to graduate and go into the world and be a teacher and you never be in theater. I'm like, of course, there's other important things in the world as well, but I'm um, just like, shook, so shocked to them. But what we're trying to do right now, and it, it is a lot of money and it is for us a provincial government. Every uh, four years, and we right have what we're trying to do is again this systemic change. That word, the systemic change, is what our Vancouver Foundation loves right now. They're not curing homelessness or poverty. They don't, they don't care about it. Yeah, we're trying to get it in the curriculum that they see here um, every year, and so that we would. I mean, it is selfish, but also good that we would be become a part of their regular. Um, and it's going to take a long time, and but so we're also fighting the clock because we only have the liberal government for two more years, so we don't really know what's happening. Um, but that's what we're trying to work towards um, in in PD. It's in our wow. yeah, which is amazing. Well, it's amazing, but um, yeah. but there, there's a huge space in there because okay. it's still not valued. So whilst it's still it's in the kind of three to the curriculum and uh, kind of engaging with arts and culture and into the theatre, uh, having those experiences embedded into it, but the teachers will choose the easiest route. Right. So going to the museum is an easier route than going to the theatre or having a theatre piece in the school. And then, well, having theatre come to school is easy, but it's, it's the choices that are being made. Mm -hmm. So for teachers, actually going to the museum is more educationally right. So, you know, there, there are different there are there. That is, kids don't go to the theater, so therefore, the teachers can go to the theater, so the teachers are going to go to the theater. Okay, well, yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's, like, it's exposure, it's experience. Yeah. What happens in your, or your early 20s has a massive impact on you for the rest of your life. So, what is the experience that you're able to do? That's why I think. Because I think giving those experiences to, to our young children and their parents, because actually it's the 
it's really just going to change the <laughs> informs the relationship. It, 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 it develops the relationship. The experience of watching parents and watching their babies in performance for the first time, you know, they're going, I didn't know my babies. You know, it engages them like for 45 minutes. I watched Dahlia uh, actually very much this year last year. She makes durational installation art. She's a piece that's uh, she does for six hours. This installation space and have a 90 minute break line. And I saw it in uh, Spain uh, in November, and I sat in my parents' 20 minutes. And this piece for our zoo was still 15, 16 months. And there were babies in there who were in there before I arrived and left after I left. And I've never seen babies just be so kind of happy and present, and their parents are really present. And because the babies are happy, if they need to be Bed, they can go out and come back in again. They can do everything to just kind of set up, but they have this incredible experience. And the, the kind of communing that is happening between the babies and the other audience throughout this thing, and the parents are so kind of okay with it that they're quite happy that we're here and the babies over and they're just making a room kind of trying to meet me, and then coming back and having this whole kind of experience of this immersive, multi sensory experience. Is, is, is one of the richest experiences that I've ever seen, and one that they, they, it completely opened my mind in terms of work for babies and my small work for babies. So, like, it's it's really, really just like different approach um, and, and how to be human again. But it's those kinds of experiences that actually support where our children, kind of how we develop, how we. But I've seen recently, I 
I've seen some magicians who also hate magic and they do it completely differently. <laughs> but I've spent the past 20 years not going to magic shows. <laughs> we should go to that second. <laughs> Except for the few people that now I've seen that are hilarious because they make fun of them. You ever seen Shipper of the Wolves? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, sort of to Aristotle's question and this question of educator versus artist, I'm, I'm sure it's just, I think I wrote up in a way, and this project was on that. And so, like, institutional change, like, the Lincoln Center reframed is thinking about accessibility and agency for. Certainly, neurodiverse people in a pretty profound way um, because of that condition. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, I or that core team is solely responsible for that. It's a really massive juggernaut in an effort. Um, but what's interesting, a lot of wrenches and the spokes and uh, uh, I don't call it that, but there was a lot of very strong opinions from so many different people that almost didn't make that show come to fruition. Parents from educators, this is best practice. I am the expert, this is what we do. It was this really pretty moment of artists and educators being like, We're a theater company, we make theater. Mm -hmm. Like, if you want education or you want intervention, go somewhere else, right? Yeah, like, go elsewhere. Like, we took some of those best practices, and um, you know, and not everybody maybe love that. Maybe I don't know, maybe I love it, but um, yeah. Alex. <laughs> um. But it was it was interesting. And finally, you know, one of the biggest questions we get from the center of the staff and the board is how do you train those people? Um, how do you train those actors to be so good? The irony is they're great facilitators. They're not like, and now I'm acting with a capital A. Um, now I'm doing magic with a capital A, right? It's like a lack of well, when they're not, it's probably much better. And so um, it's uh, it's been fun to be a maker. It, it's I was saying to her earlier. On camera, actually, helping sort of carve the United States touring identity from a young, like I'm just on the cusp of um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> when the arts has said this years ago from Seattle Theater, she said, Man, I don't know what you guys are doing, but keep fucking doing it. Like, I wish I could do that. I was like, oh, That's cool. Like, the idea that a, a, a carving a, a West United States based touring identity, like, that, that what He's existed before even when we were growing up. That doesn't necessarily have to be the box that we aspire to. That's not necessarily what success looks like for us. Um, and so it's been really fun to jockey this balance of educator and artist and facilitator of an artistic experience. And that's all I'm doing. I'm objectively doing it. Theater with absolutely zero people. Um, or just for the sake of theater. I'm with an inquiry question. And if you're interested in that inquiry question, you can watch it. Um, if you're not, come on. Uh, but it's been it's been fun to let let go lightly of a lot of the sacredness and preciousness of having to do anything and not just do the parties. And what's interesting is that a lot of those educators, uh, you know, now being it's the long throw. Our friends at Green Club, it like you're like I want change now, right? Like you, you get accused of a lot of stuff on social media every second and change now. Um, we have people that leave our company necessarily. They want immediate pivot. And those folks that we went to educational theater with in 2009 are now the teachers bringing their kids to see Trusty Sidekick as an echelon of working TY. Like, it's all long throw stuff, you know, it's, um, but it's hard because we don't want such immediate, um, even around the, the ASD work, you know, get called, like, make something for us now. We want, we want it now. Like, what do you, well, what, is that, what does that mean to you? Well, I don't know, do something. Um, so, okay, but, well, maybe in 2022, we'll be able to, this will all snap together. And even still, Lincoln Center, being a relative, so that was a 2015 work that in 2018 we saw this festival that will probably get back, you know, I know, or some kind of the festival. But like, it's it's still a program that's, uh, and, and a, and a uh, tangent of work that's um, being developed. And I think we're, we're we might be focused a little bit on. Oh, good, that happened. That's a benchmark for it. So a lot of carbon copies of that we have. People kept writing up in the way. So like I said, do your own thing. Do your own thing. Like, it's just one way to do it. One experience. And maybe teachers want to take their kids to other kids. And that's great. That's the best. So I was like, I like that. I'm like, oh, cool. Good. <laughs> that's good. There's other stuff you can like. And I can't say, what? What do you it's an interesting negotiation with 
artistry and presenter of the old age and, and social political responsibility The, the whole um, uh, standard assessment was much bigger, and uh, we were it's a lot of the but uh, we took actually a step back from being um, uh, doing a representing arts program or so. And uh, we saw in the schools that kids were flipping out about the, you know getting all the all the stress and all and and the teachers were all concerned about it. Obviously, the, uh, the administrators were concerned about it. So we actually um, instead of talking about what you feel your impact needs to be as an artist. We moved away from what our normal theater experience or theater shows were, and we actually developed a show um, called This Is Only a Test. And it was, yeah, and then we had another, show, and we did a whole video series on it as well, uh, that like the city theater, I think we did a, and, um, and uh, but it was, uh, it, it was just basically, we weren't, the, the, the schools were bringing, um, the, uh, the schools weren't going to theaters during the testing time, and they weren't bringing artists in because if it doesn't have something specific to you know, testing and educating the students, and the like that, you're even you know, more. So, we did a show that was fun and really silly and arts and, and just in multimedia, and, and someone got high in the face in the end, and uh, what it teaches kids love it. But actually, anyway, but it was teaching them all very specific. You, you know, people like to have positive attitude. Here's exactly how to do it. You know, here's some uh, very specific, like, you know, brain dimension or something like that. And it was forget, like, they, the educators were saying, well, the kids need to learn this, they need to learn this. And even when we were researching it, they're saying they need to learn these specific things. We're like, screw that, we can't teach about that positive And the response it was, it was, this is what we think from our perspective of we just screw what everyone else says, we're right. But, no, 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 sorry. but we felt like that was so important, and we get, and then we were both solid all the time through that area, through that testing area, because we were doing something that was so completely different and giving the kids something that they actually needed, and it was showing to be incredibly effective. Something that was being said earlier, just to piggyback on that, that um, we brought Chad up like showcase last year, and for all intents and purposes, it has a lot of the formula to be a very successful international property. Uh, no language uh, for page two and up, fairly cheap to move around, um, but didn't get much traction in terms of the international scope. And we're really learning a lot about like what, what the, yeah, where, where, who we are in the world, which is interesting. But the success that we have had with it is uh, we've built these relationships with the partners that we work with. And that, that sometimes is also with the school um, that was like, oh, for, yeah, success for us is in like we, we went to 9,000 cities in the years from back then. Like we visited 4,000 cities, or, you know, 50, 300 cities to end from, you know, it's like quality is assessed on how many places you can be. Um, and the places we've been so far, all of those feel like they could produce partnerships, not just for like we have another show to tour, we would bring it to you, but like can we come and work with your audience? Uh, administrators, teachers, and create something for your institution. Um, that could then go on to work with you too, but like, uh, maybe I'm, again, like, dating myself, so I've been, like, just on the line edge, but like, bespoke, it's bespoke theater. Like, I, I, I seek out bespoke exercise class, boutique exercise class, I, like, everything is boutique, farm to table, everything, everything is, like, hyper catered, it's for you, it's, and, us, I think we're trying, we are creating that way too. And maybe in a subconscious way, but it feels very fun to take the theater and like wanting to, we want to work with you because you want to do what you do. Like not like we want to churn product out for trillions and trillions, even though that's great too. Um, how, how does that work? Like, I think that's amazing. And what, what, uh, what we try to do is we, we definitely cater all of our study guides and all of our resources to every district that we're in. I'd love for it to show up very good we go to, but I don't know, I'm just like, yeah. Trustee's thinking about, I mean, like, we're, the way we first go on today is we're thinking about the dance between a not for profit entity and a for profit entity. Like, it's a theater company. Companies have that phrase. Like, yeah. it's a bit like you grow up with it and you're like, you're getting old and how do you sustain it? And it's, 
we're not that like we're out, we're out of ideas, let's do this. It's, it's actually just we're just trying to think about um, we actually are doing this right now with strategic plan and long term looking at other companies of our sample size and like what's interesting about that and different are they animals or are they habitats or are they like the TP and whether it's you creating a world that people live in beyond you or if you're just gonna if your company can start and then it will die maybe. Um, but like punch drunk is a great example of a for profit and not Entity yeah. that's like kicking ass and taking names and giving those names to other people's butts. They give. Um, it's it's we're just it's there's we're wondering if there's a different way than aspiring to having a space and filling seats with box office. So it's it's one it's the great experiment for us. Have you small have you done it yet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a proposal in the works to like activate that in a more formal way, but that came with a really more formal opportunity that was. Initiated because of the work we've done in things like being on Relic Festival. Like, again, years, stuff that we did years ago is now paying off as a potential commercial thing. I don't know. But who knows if it'll happen? So, but again, that's a great, that's just a big experiment. We don't know. Well, what you're talking about to me sounds like you're making clear, which, like, um, and I completely separate from, or can be separated from, your core. And it kind of connects back to what some of the Ryan Porters we were talking about when we walked into this. So, thank you, guys. Um, and how we, like, our fourth question was how do we continue the impact um, of a piece of an experience um, after the performance is over? And what type of experience do we personally, as artists or presenters, say, I, I'm thinking of more of like, for me, what kind of impact do I want to create? And how can we build experiences that live longer than, and that like, intentionally live longer than after the festival? Is this just something that you, you talked about today, or is this yeah. a question that you've had before? Yeah, this was a question. When we were uh, deciding what we wanted to talk about over the breaking bread, we were thinking about how to make the and how sustainable. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to work out. I've been trying to work out uh, uh, some of the ideas about video production as well. Uh, Uh, and I want to work on something that happens beforehand and actually leads up to the show, and then afterwards, either it, uh, and then also works with the community to like possibly really a scavenger hunt, like work with libraries, right? The public libraries would love to do things on uh, while on that. Um, would love to help people uh, build stuff. I would mean, love to like build scavenger hunts within individual scavenger hunts in each city, like um, like you know, what is go for the uh, geocaching or anything like that and if you can find local groups uh, to help you with that and then build that into an app and give them like a backhand version to do that it's something that we're video can lead up to it and then the community can lead up to your show and then for our show our show is completely uh, interactive where they can have clues and if they can learn those clues now they know things that happen in the show and then in the show give them more clues to go back out into the which actually reminds me of this uh there are other they're crazy. They're, I don't know if I would consider them. I guess they're two day theater experiences that happened in things like San Francisco, a square. But a square. Uh, maybe I don't know the name, but it's like you and your, it's like a honeymoon where you pay like $3,000. It's like you go through a whole <laughs> individualized murder mystery yeah. where you like solve it and you can love it. There's a company in Canada that just got to get a council grant. He basically rich people on a plane in the UK to watch a play in an alley. But you just drive the plane and you pay like 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then that leads to like accessibility, like who are these? No, it's not accessible. Most of the other kids. And like what can be like Ryan Reynolds being like, oh my god, this is really cool. Only for ten dollars, how about it? Yeah. Um I can start, go ahead. I was gonna add um something that I <laughs> uh, the first thing is the curatorial uh, framework. Um, I think this actually this morning put on my Facebook page. We can have that aesthetic perspective on this website, Animating Democracy. It just discusses a new way to analyze the work to small community. So I can just uh, do that as an offering. But I'm starting a new endeavor. I ran through the Last year to do a series, and it was just really, I, I think it was very 
very transactional. And it, um, so as I now read, as I'm trying to do the 360 weeks approach in every aspect of my organization, everything to do is how do you go from transactional to transformational? Um, and this happens with curating, we're inviting, we're starting with 10 teaching partners, and we're going to just with commitment and then we work with those individuals over the course of time and we're getting more questions and we find out it's all about the relationships. Um, also in the people theory in terms of team and the building team together, um, there was a how do you do more community and starting that in a way to create more inclusivity that sometimes we want to shut down or share our problems. So if you've been curating <laughs> so if you've been curating something for X amount of years, I, I just challenge you that how can we bring more people to the table to choose who are going to be in the class mm -hmm. um, So I just wanted to throw that on the rest of the group to talk about the yeah, I'm not a well, presenter, you're a presenter. I'm the director of PD engagement. Okay. So yeah. My whole job is to bring people together. She's the kid. <laughs> 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 no, no, I just did it. Okay, so everyone is going to be interviewed. No, I'm just like telling this to everybody. Everyone in the room. And then also, like, I'm, I'm making, um, I think I said this in my first day, but like, I am not directing our show in a season, and I'm sharing and giving you, you know, equal opportunity. So it's just like looking at the framework, and there is like a new generation of artists in this room, and I just challenge everyone: you don't have to do everything like it's been done. Our field is very outdated, like the systems that we are asking to be asked to operate in this room, and like the whole performing arts business has changed, but yet. We're being asked to operate a system that's years old and doesn't have changes. So I just want to get that out. But yeah, that's all. Okay. Do you have anything that makes you really curious about kids? And kids in different communities, and it shows that we love in this place and we see kids and this is what they like. It's like in their age. Um, it makes me want to learn more about, you know, kids. I recently had a meta night for the kids in the area of the city 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 of the all of the city 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 of the and so, to your point of like taking, not saying that you can't stress it up, but um, all the time down, I think through my particular challenge, and I think that I got to use the kids going to be in the area of the school, they can even talk about it for the kids going to the area. It's just been a huge thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah there's a follow up. I was just going to say, because we're uh, running a little low on time, less than 10 minutes. Um, you guys have done a really phenomenal job of anticipating, I think, all of, so most of the Brian Porter questions we brought to the table anyway. Um, but one thing that we also wanted to ask about, maybe we can talk about it on a slight note, is what is, what is the role of humor in Team Maya? Is it always necessary? What are best practices? What does it look like? Are there other ways to go about it? You know where I went. <laughs> Storyteller and we perform together, but I, I 
everything needs to be funnier for me, and everything needs more story for her in the fight that we have in the middle of the report. And when we did the testing show, it was all like I was like, more comedy, more comedy, more during this, more comedy, more comedy. Okay, a little something right here. And I did it a spoonful of that. Or no, that's wrong. <laughs> 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 It, it just works, it facilitates everything. Hi. Um, I thought I'd quickly comment on comedy. Um, it's not just for the K through sevens, but I think it's especially important that in teamwork, we throw comedy in. Um, it's relatable. And again, things with adults find funny, maybe very different, but children find funny. And we found that especially in our younger work, our K through ten, there are, you know, we like to sprinkle in things for the adults as well. So the older audience on the page because the educators, they're still our audience. Mm -hmm. and they're not just there for the kids to sit there and mark their papers while the kids are watching. We want it to be just engaging for them. So we do find um, when we work with our playwrights, we want that humor, we want it to be relatable, we want it to be um, within the realm of what funny these days. We actually were just doing a show and um, at one point a character, he was you know referencing him from Frozen, sort of saying it. And it felt a lot of for school. And one of the kids after was like, Frozen's not cool anymore. We like Moana. <laughs> <laughs> and so we changed it. She went, great. Moana's the show, so let's do Moana. And so I think it's also important to stay relevant with what's important to kids and what's funny to them. And with teens as well, to not pander to them. Um, and as someone said, you know, not be didactic and you know, listen to the humor, listen to what's funny to them. Um, even if it's just a chuckle, it's really interesting what lands hard on the TV shows and then what just dries up and doesn't land at all. And so we plot that um, constantly with our show reports too. We're always looking at what's landing in what way, whether it's laughter, whether it's like a gasp. Um, we plot that and if things start to kind of fall apart a little bit or just aren't landing, we'll address that even during the run to make sure that it sticks. But yeah, the humor. Yeah, and even during uh, the process of creation of the art, I think it's it's also important to trust your instincts at the same time. If you don't think it's funny, don't put it in there. Which probably gets you pandering a little bit. Yeah. But I think the first one the children's play I ever wrote, I left a joke in. Like oh, I couldn't much it up, but you know what? Yeah, kids will probably find this cute. Six <laughs> weeks now, one yeah. laugh. <laughs> but it's because I didn't think it was funny. Mm -hmm. So if you don't trust you. Well, Bronwyn was actually um, giving the example to um, someone at the conference too. Penguin, go ahead. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had we had a, a show around the school audience that is about social anxiety. It's also a really funny show about friendship and two like goofballs that are friends. And the uh, it, it revolves around Halloween, and one of the characters is really excited about the penguin costume. And the first time the actor comes out in the penguin costume. I almost see my hand laughing. We all lost it. It was like so funny. But it's also like random staff. So yeah. like adults. And I was like, we can't do that. We're going to lose the audience. Like, we, like, I don't know. It has to be less funny. Like, do less things that are funny. And then our opening day in a gym full of five to six hundred K seven year olds, not one last. Mm -hmm. The pink costume. They're like, it's Halloween. Of course you're wearing a costume. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like things that we assume are going to work. Or like with our team work, we're like talking about Twitter and stuff.
terms of the moment It's not humor for humor's sake or comedy for God's sake. It, it's only funny to get juxtaposed to some the other the, 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 the humor is what you're saying. Like, that, that is comes to mind too. He does both of those things so well and has a hysteric this one moment like, oh my God. And to have a sense of humor is to have a sense of the truth and the place that you are. Yeah. 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 Bring it all back to like why bring, why bring your work somewhere away? Really organic. Being able to recognize a situation or something that has happened to you and identify with that, and then laughing off your relief. Okay, I get that. I've dropped something on my toe before, and that's something I recognize, so I respond. All right. Um, hi there, Paul. <laughs> Great, so thank you all so much for being with us, for being here. Um, I hope that something landed for you or that some decisions will continue to have an impact longer than what's coming. And so thank you. Can I have one thing? You look like you look really determined. No, 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 no. no, no, no. I've been working with the so I can. Oh, you really? <laughs> 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 I was like, come on. I'm going to say, for those that weren't able to come to the table, if you want to write something on it, like, this is your chance to write something on it. Totally.